Welcome to Michael's. My name is Peter Michael. It's my pleasure to introduce Michaela Skovranova. Good job. <laughs> that was uh, not so easy. Um, now, I think we're in for a pretty special talk because this young lady next to me looks pretty young, but even though she looks so young, she's from Sydney, which is Sydney based, Sydney Australian based filmmaker, photographer, director, and Olympus visionary. So you can't get to be all those things for so young unless you're pretty special. So can we please give a warm welcome to Michaela. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm really happy to see so many of you. First of all, I wanted to ask, so how many of you, do any of you do underwater photography? Okay. Not yet. Awesome, not yet. Maybe after this talk, maybe still never after this talk. Camera. Sorry? I've still got an underwater camera. Oh, that's great. I can swim. That's <laughs> that is a very good start, I have to say. So thank you so much. So I am originally from Slovakia, so I do have a little bit of an accent. If you can't hear me or if you can't you know, understand, I will speak up or I will speak slower. Just let me know. So I thought I'd start off with uh, a little bit about me. So I am Slovakian born. I, I moved to Australia when I was 13. Slovakia is a landlocked country, but we ended up moving next to the ocean, which is really beautiful and a beautiful gift from my family to be able to grow up near the ocean. Uh, I recently relocated to up north near Byron Bay, which is a really beautiful pocket of Australia. The ecosystem is just incredible. And a couple of years ago, um, Olympus got in touch with me as well and asked if I wanted to work on some personal projects. So the way I got involved with Olympus is they actually found me on Instagram. So it's really great in terms of to be able to share your work and things that you love and if you do that, inevitably, people will f connect to it somehow. you just got to keep on putting yourself out there in that way. So I wanted to show you a little video of... Um, this video was shot a year ago, and this is from one of my personal projects that I collaborated with Olympus. And some of the footage was not shot by me, most of it has been, but you can kind of see what I do from this. So that's a little bit of, of my work, thank you. Um, basically, I work with natural light only. I don't use any strobes underwater, anything like that. And most of the time I use breath hold. I am scuba certified as well. I got certified in 2008. However, I found it was very restrictive for me to be able to move the way I like to move. Um, and then free diving came about because I was going to Tonga and you're not allowed to scuba with the whales unless you have a special permit. So I thought, okay, what can I do to allow me to capture the images that I want to? So I started to kind of just snorkeling and free diving. But in saying that, those images were not, or the video wasn't captured at depth at all. I only work up to five to 10 meters of depth. So it's very achievable for people that know how to swim and you don't have to go deep and you don't have to scuba and you don't have to be anything in terms of a specialist to be able to do underwater photography which is what I find is really beautiful. So I wanted to talk about how I approach personal projects. So I do a mixture of 
stills, um, a bit of writing, and then a video pace as well to kind of accompany the whole project. A lot of my projects are long term, so Tonga has been happening for about three or four years now. And I might only, I might get 20,000 images, but then I might just select one or two from each particular year, and the series will continue to change and shift and develop as I do as well. The, what I like to do is to be able to switch between stills and video while I'm working. So I've chosen a kit that allows me to do that. And I would often just be photographing and then flick to video and do a bit of video on the side. And I think that's a really great thing for everyone to consider. These days our cameras, they all do video and they all do really high quality video. So while you're in that environment, why not get a little bit? And it always kind of adds another element to a project, especially you can use it as projections or as intro to an exhibition. So my work at the moment, I work as a commercial photographer and a filmmaker, but my main focus is working on artworks and installations and where I want to take my work is to a larger scale exhibitions. Um, so I thought I'd show you an introduction from the Tonga project. And this project is called Love Scars. And it started just with this one single, very, very quiet, quiet image. And I wasn't, I didn't notice it at first. And sometimes it takes a really long time for images to kind of pop up and speak. It might be a year. And you go, okay, maybe this one, because it's a quiet image. And then I uh, wrote a piece to go with it. Um, and basically, young humpback whales, they're really, really light in colour and uh, when they're born, but soon they'll become all scratched up. And we see as human scars as something negative, something that's hurt us. However, the baby whales will rub against their mums and that's how they bond and they give each other affection. And then I kind of thought that the more scratched up and scarred they are, the more loved they were. And I thought that was really beautiful. So I'm really interested in those kind of um, feelings that maybe me as a person will project, maybe these animals don't feel those things, but I feel like I can really relate in that way. So that's how the projects came about. Um, again, um, humpback whales, they, every year, they, they have a love song they sing to each other. And each, every, each kind of migration has a slightly different song, and the song will evolve throughout the season. And a year after, they'll have a brand new song that they'll all be singing to kind of get um, their, their loves. So images, basically, I would often just be, I don't, I don't really approach projects and go, okay, these are the shots that I need to get because I feel like that can be quite restrictive. And of course, in an environment like this, you don't have control. You don't, before you jump in the water, you're not really gonna know what the visibility is going to be like, uh, what the interaction is going to be like. So what I like to do is um, I choose a lens that I'm working with for that particular day, for example. Or maybe if you can, you can have two housings and you have two different lenses. So you're kind of committing before you even jump and you go, okay, I'm going to probably use these settings and I'm going to use this lens and that's it. And that makes it really simple for me than when I'm actually working because I don't have to think about am I going to zoom in for this? I can only use my body to move in and out, and obviously there's restrictions with that. And I'm using the settings that I'm used to using. And of course, on the water, the light is not going to change that much. So I'm quite strict or restrictive within my approach, and then I kind of let go, and I see what happens, and I select afterwards. And then just select beautiful moments. And this is another clip that I wanted to show you, and this was shot two years ago.
Thank you. So for this particular clip, so I think I feel collaboration is a really important part of the process as well. So what I've done for this particular piece is I got the footage that I loved and actually gave the footage to a uh, musician and she wrote the specific piece of music for that piece and she added the whale sounds into it as well and just kind of made it a different kind of piece to what it would be if I was working on it on my own. I also find with video, it's really important to let go of the fact that you might be filming for, you might have a 30 second shot, uh, shot, you might use five seconds of it, but the stills from it would have been amazing, and you, but you can't be doing both at the same time. And you've got to know for video, I need about 20 of these <laughs> little second shots to make it work, but it's stills, they could be really beautiful and really strong, but you go, okay, now focusing on video for this. I've done my stills and switching to video and just committing to that, knowing that I'm probably gonna miss stuff, stuff is gonna be out of focus, or it's gonna be shaky, I'm not gonna be able to use it. And then finding those moments that do work and making it into, and even if it's a minute clip like this, just having kind of very little expectation of how long it's going to be and just keeping it as short as it needs to be for it to be beautiful and engaging. So for me, um, a lot of people are kind of drawn to my work because of a specific style, I would say. And I had a good think about how it, that came to be. So when I was um, about 18, 19 years old, I used to work in a wildlife park. And this photo was captured in 2008. I used to work at Sydney Aquarium as an educational officer and I used to walk through the tunnels. So this was shot through the glass in the tunnels in the aquarium. And I just remember looking up going, you know, one day I would love to be able to, to see that and feel that in person. And there was no one there, it was seven o'clock in the morning and the seal came and he saw that I was taking photos and he came and kind of performed for me a little bit and had a play in the water spats. But this was taken on an eight megapixel camera um, and the rest of these images were shot on film from the series as well and it was a really long time ago. And then it wasn't until 2014 that I got to swim with the seals in real life. Um, but of course t some time had passed in between then and 2014. And I was thinking, well, what had happened? And around 2012, I started to work on personal projects and that's when the work started to look a little bit different. And I always thought, oh, I should be doing street photography because that's what personal projects are. And I should be wanting to document people and I would go out into the middle of Sydney at the busiest time of the day, into the busiest moments and I got images like this. And they are just empty with certain colours and certain tones and kind of, it already started to look underwater before I was even underwater. <laughs> <laughs> and this was taking, you know, like seven peak times and there's people everywhere, but I was really drawn to these quiet places. So it was really clear that I was actually making my work in the wrong place, but I, I didn't realize at the time at all. And um, then I did a workshop with one of my favorite photographers. I was so lucky that I got to do that. It's Trent Park. And Trent Park always said that photograph what is closest to you and the things that you enjoy and have the interest in. Make the whole process as fun as at least difficult as possible. And there's something, to, there's a lot to say in that in terms of photograph your backyard. Don't feel like you have to go to an exotic location to get beautiful images because if you can see beauty in the everyday and in those moments, then you'll be able to take that everywhere you go. And I've kind of applied the same approach with my photography and underwater photography in particular. So I'm a really, really big fan of exploring your backyard. Of course, I'm really lucky. I have the most beautiful backyard in the world with turtles. Um, but I lived in Sydney and I lived um, maybe 40 minutes away from the ocean. I would just pack a backpack 
and I would put the big wetsuit in and I got asked if I was a backpacker all the time because I just had this huge giant thing that I would travel with and I didn't have an underwater housing. I would just borrow things from friends. I'd have a little point and shoot. I'd have a GoPro, whatever it was I could borrow, even if it was for 10 minutes. And I started to kind of play and explore. And I would let little, I call them beautiful accidents, you know, because oftentimes with images like this, for instance, we would, that's just bubbles that are stuck on the dome port and the light caught them and it created a rainbow in within the photograph. But often we might think, oh, we have to clean the dome, make it really nice and um, then this was, wouldn't be able to happen. So what I actually do, I don't really, I don't look through the viewfinder when I shoot at all. I just use the screen and I just kind of photograph and, and float. And I try again not to control the environment too much. Um, so for me is how do you kind of begun, begin to explore? And I think, you know, of course, for underwater photography or any kind of photography, what do we photograph? Um, how do we, and I just think the biggest, most important thing is, is being okay with documenting the things that we're naturally drawn to. And I'd always struggled with that because I'd go on a location and I go, well, I should be getting these kind of images because that's what is expected of me. And I would never, and I would even tell clients and I'm like this is what I'll bring back for you and it never happened and I'd always come back with something completely random and I was like oh sorry guys but how <laughs> but I had to kind of go okay well I'm just telling my story in like a slightly different way I have I'm in tune with different things I'll look and see different things and with these kind of explorations what do we photograph well, it doesn't have to be an ocean, it can be a lake, it can be a pool, it can be a waterfall, it can, you know, photograph it, there is no wildlife. If the visibility is bad, then just photograph your foot, whatever it is, because you'll start to kind of find things as you're doing that. And for example, with images like this, this is just a group of swimmers that, that swam past me one day. They did, they did that once, they're actually trying to do a selfie on the water. And I was watching them and I took a photo. And um, we can't really plan for moments like this. Um, another big tip, I think, is just getting really comfortable. I actually got swimming lessons. I'm not a strong swimmer at all. And because I kick, I can, like really bad freestyle. I just don't use my arms at all because I'm holding the camera. So when uh, I started to get into underwater photography, which was only three years ago, I ended up getting some swimming lessons and I ended up doing a free diving course as well, which allowed me to kind of troubleshoot if there was a problem and just see my limits and, and work within those limits. Um, again, these, these photographs are taken in, you know, two meters of water and middle of the day, but you can play with exposure, with, with light and not have to go into crazy depths and I just walked up from the ocean, from the beach into the water. I also think just use the tools that we have. A lot of the times it's very unattainable to be doing underwater photography because of all the logistics that are involved. And part of the expenses of course come from the scuba diving part of it and the housings as well. There's so many different options now and it makes it really achievable for people to be able to do it. So you can use like a little point and shoot, which shoots raw images now as well. And you can have different kinds of housings. And I really love obviously the lighter. So a lot of scuba housings are massive and they're really heavy, which is really good when you're underwater because you are negatively buoyed. However, if you are free diving and you're chasing a whale, you're gonna, this, this a big housing is gonna be a lot of hard work. So something smaller suited me a lot better. Um, again, so get to know your equipment. Um, part of being able to document in a really free way 
is, is not having to think about the settings. So that's why I choose one lens, I choose my settings, and I practice. And I basically go in, even if it's horrible, let's say I'm working with a different kind of equipment that I'm not used to, the layout might be a little bit different. So what do you do? So you have to know, and the good thing is like the back of it is clear, so you can kind of see, and the buttons are very clearly assigned. But for me, I just want to be able to go, yeah, this does this, this does this. I don't even have to think about it, and I don't even look at it. So then I can switch from stills to video really easily as well, because I already know the settings, and I know which buttons, and I can even assign buttons and just switch it really quickly. And then, it just allows a bit of freedom and just getting, just being really comfortable. Of course, with the cameras now, they've got so many settings and so many options that we can be working with, but really we just need the basic things. And of course, a uh, big fan of just going at different times of the day. When I was learning um, underwater photography, I always got told, go in the middle of the day because it's nice and bright and you'll be able to expose and go when the conditions are good. But then you just never find what it actually looks like in those times when you shouldn't be going. And you get the most beautiful light when the sun is setting. And of course, it doesn't really work maybe if you're on scuba and you need more light or those kind of things. But when you are just having fun, or you go into the waves, but you just have to get out there and have a tool that allows you to do that with ease. So that's why I'm a really big fan of just having little cameras, little lenses, and I'd often take like even a point and shoot when I'm exploring, like let's say I'm hiking, and even though this camera is small, I might not really have time to be stopping my friends who are already like, you know, kilometers ahead of me, and go, oh, can I just take a photo? So a little point of shoot camera allows me to kind of explore light. And what I do every single morning and throughout the day, I wake up and I start photographing straight away. So it's just practice. It's like doing exercise or anything that you, you know, if you're learning piano. So you're always, always practicing and seeing new things. And the light will change throughout the day as well. So I have a point and shoot and I just, have fun and just as I say I'll be just taking photos of everything all the time and then eventually that will seep through into my work and I'll see things that I didn't before and I might be walking past something and I'll see the light has changed and I'm just like oh well that's different and then I'll bring my camera and document that afterwards. This quote is from one of my best friends, he's a Melbourne based photographer and he'd always say, so every time I go on a trip and I come back and I go, I have no images. <laughs> I completely stuffed up the whole thing. And now because it's always so different to what I expected. It's just, you go in with an idea. For example, my Antarctica work, which I'll show afterwards. I went in to photograph underwater. And I was like, yes, I'll get penguins, I'll get these animals and it's going to be amazing. It was the worst visibility I've ever been in. It's wor it was worse than Sydney Harbour because there was an algae bloom. So it was great for, for the environment, but of course it was impossible to photograph. I wasn't sure if I was photographing my foot or a penguin. That's how bad it was. So, and I had to really recalibrate and go, well, what am I doing? I, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to bring back what I really thought I was going to. And I was quite devastated by that. And, also just going, well, how do I look at things? And then I just kind of relaxed a bit and started to photograph and explore differently. And one of the greatest things that my friend had told me that we can only see what we're in tune to see as it happens. We capture what we're drawn to. We get to share our entire life story in the images that we create. And that's why it's so special. So if you ever take a trip, and you're looking through other people's photographs and they go, well, that, they got that so much better than I did. But I just, it can't be true because we just didn't see it. We see something different and that's what makes the vision unique because it's the only thing that you can make and no one else will be able to replicate that. 
So from this approach, from the worst visibility in the world, in the greatest place in the world, I believe, this project came about. So this one, sorry, is a behind the scenes of Antarctica. Brilliant. So basically, this clip was all shot handheld and kind of pieced together afterwards. I wasn't sure, again, what it was going to look like. Um, and then this body of work emerged. And again, I just never expected to make anything like this. And of course, it's got the same look, the same style, but it wasn't what I was going there to capture. And you just create these kind of beautiful but dramatic pieces of ice scapes and just this glistening ocean and just kind of galaxies underwater. And this particular image, the piece of ice was about this big. It was tiny. And again, so I was like, I can't see the animals underwater, so what else can I do? And we were not allowed to go near big icebergs because they flip and you need specialist training for that as well, and it just wasn't part of the, uh, the expedition. So I just got a wide-angle lens, and I went in right close. Literally, the dome port was touching the ice, and it allowed to kind of create images that have a distortion in scale. And with the soundtrack of that last piece, I actually used a hydrophone, and I recorded the sound of icebergs underwater, and it sounds like popcorn. And then I gave it to a music artist, again based in Melbourne, and um, he extracted, he kind of stretched the sounds and created an atmospheric piece. And he also created a sound for this next coming piece as well. So with this one, the music dictated the pace the shots were cut. So it's a very slow piece and there's a lot of bubbling sounds and, and textures. So it really dictated the way that I edited. And I've got footage that will just be like single takes. And it's really kind of interesting because when I was creating this, I'm going, this is never going to work on a small screen. And I go, what, how can I work this? How can I share this? Because of course we all want to be sharing our work on social media, etc. But I just know on a small screen, the impact is not there. And I, in an ideal world, these kind of works would be felt in a really large scale. But I know that might not happen for a couple of years. So I have to be really patient, and which is difficult, and go, okay, I have to hold back on this work. And when the time is right and I get the opportunity, I'll be able to show it in the way that I'd love to show it. 
And part of the other things that I want to chat about is the equipment that I use. So that's me, and that's a whale, and baby <laughs> whale. And you can see, so I'm just underneath the surface. Um, with wildlife, you don't always get, with whales especially, you don't always get to go under because you have to kind of gauge the behaviour. And we always go with guides and we get educated about how to approach and certain different scenarios allow for certain different things. But you can see, so I'm just under the surface and I'm actually filming there and I don't use the viewfinder and I use handles and I have a chest mount as well which has got a TG tracker on it as well. And uh, the camera is, so it's the EM5 Mark II and the housing is so tiny and so light. So this camera is this, this big and the housing is, t is about that big. It also has a flat port as well, which basically means it just has one point of contact where it could leak. And that's amazing. So for a really beautiful professional type capture, but with very little opportunities for anything to go wrong. It also floats, so it's ideal if you're looking to do surf photography as well. And it's really light. So with surf, of course, like the camera can hit you in the face, which is not ideal. And of course, if you get like tumbled, you want to be able to let go of the camera and it will float up to the surface and you're not going to lose it. Because so obviously safety in your life is more important than the camera will just float back up and you can collect it afterwards. And you can see the range of lenses that I use. So I used a 12mm lens, which I love using for underwater. A lot of the times people lean towards the fish eye, which is beautiful, but it distorts the animals a lot as well. So it will stretch them. So it doesn't really give an accurate kind of representation of the shape. So I love using the 12mm, which is wide enough for whales. Uh, and then 25 and a 60mm as well. Um, for Antarctica, I use this kit, which I've got here. So a little bit bigger. The beauty about this particular housing is that you can actually change ports. So if you've got different lenses, you can switch around. This is a port for a macro 30mm lens. And uh, it's a little bit heavier, but that is good for filming. And also that's a reason why I use the handles as well. So it gives me stability and I can kind of move the camera away from my body a little bit and just do smooth takes. The lenses that I'd be using as well is a 25mm and the 12 to 100mm, which is this lens. And it has image stabiliser on the lens as well. So it works with the internal stabiliser and it's just incredible for a handheld. Like to be able to film on a boat, on a Zodiac that's going like this, handheld, and it not to be shaky is incredible. A lot of the times you'd need to have some sort of like a Ronin or a handheld gimbal. You don't need it anymore with this kind of equipment. So it allows me to travel. And of course, if you're taking underwater housing, if you're taking your camera, you're wet, so dry, so whatever you have with you, your luggage is gonna be 20 plus kilos already. So anything that you can save kilos on is a good thing. And um, that's the handles that I use. And I actually have just started to explore with the, the TG5. And it's such a fun little point and shoot camera. It shoots raw, it does 4K video. I used to take my phone and then go hiking and then it would just get smashed and, <laughs> you know, and it would start raining and things like that. Or this is a waterproof camera, shockproof, freeze proof and you can do things that you can't do with, <laughs> with your phone. And of course, you can, like, you can even jump into a waterfall, for instance, and, and have a floating device on it. So if you let go, it will just float back up. So for me, the most important thing about the kit is how unbreakable it is and how easy it is for me to use and how light. Because I'm not a big frame person, so how do I get from A to B as quickly as possible without getting exhausted? Especially for the whales, the, um, the tours, for example, or Antarctica, they'll be for eight days and 
we'd be swimming from, you'd be on the boat from seven o'clock in the morning till sunset and you're in and out of the water swimming a lot. And of course, that weighs you down over time. So I want to be able to conserve as much energy when I need to. And that's why I like lighter pieces of kit that allow me to do a lot of different things at a time. So I wanted to open up the room for any questions that you might have about, yeah? You, on your underwater housing, mm -hmm. how often do you actually change the seals on them? Hardly ever. So a lot of people think you have to keep them like them really yeah, lubricated. Yeah, on my, the old houses, mm -hmm. I never yeah. But every three months I would change the seal. You don't have to. Big bulky things up. Really? Mm. Well, um, for me, not, not, I never change the seals. I keep them lubricated, yeah. but again, not too much. People think every week or so. Not true at all. I think just every couple of months you can check them, have a look, see if they've got dirt on them. When you're flying, it's really good to remove the seal. You pop it out because the compression um, might damage it. So you want to make sure that that's out of the housing and then you can just put it in like a clear bag so it doesn't get dirt and hair stuck on it. Lubricate it again, wipe it so you don't want to have like excess silky um, seals and then just pop it on. And I definitely don't overdo it because again, you, wanna, you can just do, eye, do an eye check and see if the seal is good. And for me, to be honest, I don't go that deep as well. So if there is a leak or anything like that, I can come up to the surface really easily. And I've never had a leak. And generally speaking, if a housing does leak, it's usually human error. And the best way to avoid that is you can set up your housing at home without the camera and you put it in a bathtub, right? And then you just leave it in a bathtub, let it float around or sink. And you see, you take it out and see if there's any water in it. And if there's no water, then it's very likely you'll be fine when you put your camera in and you go for a swim. But always test it beforehand. Anyone else? What time of the year did you go to Tonga? The best time to go to swim with the whales is during migratory season, which is now. So June, July, August, September, October. And Tonga is one of the, uh, legally the only place where you can swim with whales. They've opened up opportunities in Australia, but Tonga is a nursing ground. So basically with whales, they can move pretty fast and you want to be able to interact with settled whales and allow for quieter, slower interactions. And that's usually the mums and the calf. So that's why people go to Tonga. And there is a limit of maximum four people in the water plus a guide at any given time with a whale. And you can only be with a mum and a calf for up to an hour. Sometimes the interactions last for five minutes. Sometimes you get a whole day and you only get to swim once or, or not, no, none at all. So that's why it's good to go for a few days and give yourself a bit of time for weather and, of course, wildlife. You, you, you don't know. Yes? I use whatever I need to. So I think the beauty with the cameras these days is it allows for high ISO without the noise. With video, there's certain ISOs that work best. So like 640, 320, the in-betweens. So if I'm doing video, I'll be more mindful of that because shooting video is more like shooting on a JPEG. It doesn't give you as much room um, for error. So I'd be mindful of that, but underwater I find it's actually quite bright and the light's pretty constant. And because for video you want to be shooting on a specific shutter speed, like 100 or 50, that will kind of navigate what ISO I'm going to be using. So ISO 100 or 640, whatever it needs at the time. Any Has it changed your work? Have you found that actually you've really changed your photography because of what you're driving now? Definitely. So what I, I used to have a Canon and I used to have an iCloud housing, which was really nice, but it was big and heavy. 
So I would just leave it at home. I, when I went for, to, the, to the beach, I just wouldn't take it. So, and that was the biggest change. Is actually, this whole entire thing, my fins and my wetsuit fit in a backpack. And that changes everything. It's the fact that I actually have it with me to use. And then, stabilizer. A thousand. You can shoot, I've read that you can shoot the Milky Way handheld with these, with these kits. It's ridiculous. And for video, it's really important. So the worst thing with shooting video on a you know, SLR kind of kit is that they're beautiful, they're little, but it doesn't give you much stability. So you, all, you end up with a bit of shaky footage. And the stabilizer changed everything for me. So I can get really high quality footage with a tiny little kit. And also, I don't get as tired when I'm shooting. Again, it's a strength thing for me and being able to kind of move freely. So I just you can flip up the screen. And then the way I, sh I kind of move, I kind of sway like a stick insect. So I kind of, I'll be moving around a lot and kind of doing like this. So unless you're really quite strong, you have strong upper body, you're going to get tired. So, and a with a lot of my work, I might be shooting for eight hours a day for multiple days in a row. So what allows me to do that is something that's light. I also did a hike in Tasmania. Um, I never camped in my life before and I did the hardest. <laughs> I did the most brutal hike in Tasmania and it was an eight day walk, um, 20 kilo backpack through mud like this. Um, our stove was broken, so we had no f cooked food for days. And I was like, I'm going to die. And, <laughs> and then I said to myself, if I had a kid bigger than that, I would have left it on the mountain and claimed it on insurance, like, for sure. So something like this, and what I did actually, I had this in my, I had a small lens, and I turned the screen around so it wouldn't get trashed, and I had it in my jacket. And it, su it survived, like I almost didn't, but the camera did. <laughs> and I fell over and I got, you know, and it just, it was fine. And that's the beauty. I, and I've spoken to so many people that go on trips and they travel and they go, I don't take my camera with me anymore because it's just too big. And I go, well, the stuff that you get on your phone is great, but it's never going to be as beautiful. And from my work, it's really important to be able to get an image and be able to print it large. And, that I know it will live in another place, in a physical form, eventually somewhere. And if I don't take it on camera like this, I don't get to do that. So, and I find that the output out of these cameras, it holds its own. I can, and I have printed for exhibitions from this camera, and it just looks beautiful. And that's what makes me happy, that's what I want. And actually, if you guys do want to have a look, I've made a book from Tonga, and that's from the, EM5 Mark II, and the photos just, they just look, they look stunning. And that's really, like for me, it's the output. What, what am I gonna get out at, at the end of it? Is it gonna hold up on a gallery wall? And I say, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure how much, time, how much more time I've got. We're wrapping it up. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for coming. Well, now we get an idea of, of how Michaela has achieved so much in such a short time. Hard, hard work and diligent work and open mind. So thank you again. Thank you. And thank you to Olympus. And um, put our hands together, please. <laughs>